We are who we are. We know what we know, whether we know it or not. Or as the poet Charles Olson wrote, one does what one knows before one knows what one does. At the conclusion of my first interview with the warden of Angola Prison, Burl Kane, Warden Kane, who was eating lunch, pointed his biscuit at me and said, Thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. I nodded blankly and turned to leave. Don't you see, he called after me, after all is said and done, in the end, these men's fortunes come down to the luck of the draw. It's really a mystery, isn't it, why they live behind bars and we walk free. How does one come to do what one knows? How does one come to know it? How does one come to know what one did, why one did it? Perhaps it's true that everything that has something to do with anything depends on how far your apple fell from the tree. I have been deeply influenced by where my apple fell, by place, by where I was, as they say, raised up. Arkansas is not a part of the world for which Jesus Christ died, wrote a 19th century traveler to the state. <laughs> I was raised up there. For better or worse, my work is affected, sometimes infected, by what writer John Jeremiah Sullivan calls the tragic spell of the South. The mythic land of moonlight and magnolias, the Garden of Eden, the lost cause, the angry scar, the land of lest we forget a land where people openly and actively engage in ancestor worship. To my knowledge, neither my family nor my community were overly familiar with the world of fine art. Like many other Southern families, we practiced instead the arts of dress, the table, the hunt, politics, the pulpit, to a certain degree, and conversation, in particular storytelling, all of which, of course, facilitated the worship of our ancestors. Our family owned a camera and many photograph albums. We looked at the albums a lot and together. As we turned the pages, the photos would trigger stories about friends and family, both quick and dead. Stories of the Civil War that always included the words, women and children, slaves, Texas, bag of gold. Stories of great-great-uncle Julius's wildly successful moonshining empire. Always stories of my great-aunt Top, my babysitter, the most overtly bipolar member of our family. There's Top, so beautiful and talented, the family would say. She always knows just the right present to give everyone. These compliments stood in for stories better forgotten, like how she would don cowboy boots and Bermuda shorts and pick up carnies when the carnival came to town. How when she would occasionally run around the yard naked under the influence of the full moon, the Baptist would refer to her activities as the sin of dancing. I loved Aunt Top. She was my role model. And I loved photographs and stories. They in no small measure defined and formed me, whether I knew it or not, whether I liked it or not. My favorite object in our house was an orange wooden box that held hundreds of loose photographs. The photos displayed in the albums were fixed and formal, and each carried a fixed and formal story. The loose photographs, however, held an intense fascination for me. All were small, most were paper, a few were made of tin. As I held them in my hands, those photographed my great-great-grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, dogs, cats, ponies, and me, all looked directly into my eyes. Somehow, magically, they were free to speak to me in secret. I intuited their stories and feelings. I knew they wanted to be touched and seen, and they knew me. Time dissolved as we stood side by side as slips of paper. I was making contact. I was channeling my ancestors. The photographer Sujimoto said that his photographs of the sea are particularly important to him because the first time he saw the ocean, he became aware of himself. My first awareness of self occurred sitting on the living room floor, surrounded by small photographs of family, friends, horses, pets, 
inhabiting their physical worlds of houses, streets, parks, and fields. It never occurred to me as a child during my hours and hours of photo gazing to actually take a photograph myself. The matter was never discussed, but always understood. My grandmother was the family photographer. And this is an album page. Uh, and you see that my grandmother gets equal billing with a horse. <laughs> my mother was backup photographer. That's my grandmother on the left and my mother on the right at 13. I lived with my grandparents. My mother came to visit when she could. It was photographs that kept us close while she was away. Eventually, I left home, studied literature and the sin of dancing and other things. In a casual way, I was keen on taking photographs and Super 8 movies, but in 1989, I became more serious about photography. My grandmother died in 1986, and in 1988, my mother was murdered in her bed by a contract killer. I was buried by these personal losses, and because of the circumstances surrounding her murder, feared for my own life as well. I became increasingly isolated. Following my grandmother and mother, I picked up a camera and started photographing, trying to dig out, trying to make contact with people again. I photographed in coastal North Carolina, where I lived at the time, tobacco, the bone man, um, Septima with tadpoles, I photographed in Arkansas and Louisiana. I was working on a um, project called the Lost Roads Project. It was about uh, writers from Arkansas. And so I heard about this fellow that had lost his ear and then he had a prosthetic ear. So I tracked him down and um, he said, he didn't have an ear on, and he said, I'm not vain like I used to be. I don't know where those ears, that ear is. And I said, well, where did you keep it? And he said, well, sometimes I kept it in my glove compartment <laughs> in the pickup truck. I said, well, let's go look. So we went to the pickup truck and just junk everywhere, and he opened the glove compartment, about 30 ears fell out. <laughs> It was quite a sight, but he was a very good sport. <laughs> um, Sunday morning, Helena, Arkansas, outside Helena. Uh, the zombie, he's a street ma uh, magician in Helena, Arkansas. Looking back now, I realize I was re-photographing the images that I had responded to as a child just everyday people in their places, either looking directly into the camera or conscious of the camera. This is an everyday person in Louisiana. <laughs> and this is Miss Cotton. In the early 90s, I organized a series of photo album sharing events, a project to rephotograph African American family photograph albums in coastal North Carolina. I was deeply affected by the images I saw in these albums, so much so that I couldn't see any reason to continue with my own ph photographic work, but not knowing what else to do, I kept at it. I was looking for something, a project. Poet C.D. Wright wrote, some do not practice art to be entertained or support themselves or to simply manufacture objects. Some do art to be changed, healed, and charged. I wanted to be changed, healed, and charged, but the healing, charging, something I was looking for proved elusive. I had lots of ideas, but without exception, all were obvious and dreadful, years of dreadful ideas. I was looking for a project that might speak to the formal quality of loss and address the impossibility of speaking directly to those who have gone. After a time, after a time I simply gave up, let go, I took to flattening pennies on the railroad tracks, and then one day at a flea market, I found a wheel of fortune and took it home. I abandoned my internal tug of war. I just dropped the rope and began filling the house with wheels of fortune. It was an immense relief. 
As luck would have it, it was while preoccupied with collecting and spinning the wheels of fortune that the project I'd been looking for finally arrived. It arrived in a counterintuitive form and in a wholly unexpected manner, 10 years following my mother's murder. While working on a project for the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, I found myself photographing inmates in a prison in Transylvania, a wide spot in a North Louisiana road consisting of two service stations and a water tower adorned with a gigantic vampire bat. As soon as I printed the first portraits, I knew working in the prisons was what I needed to be doing for any number of reasons. You may know that the United States incarcerates more of its population than any other country in the free world. You may not know that the state of Louisiana incarcerates more of its population than any other state in the Union, if in fact one considers Louisiana a legitimate member of the Union. Many do not. And first in the U.S. means first in the world. In the Pelican State, one in 86 adult Louisianans is doing time. 25% of African American males in New Orleans are either doing time on probation or parole. For the next six years, poet C.D. Wright, many of Louisiana's inmates, and I collaborated on a project entitled One Big Self, Prisoners of Louisiana. I photographed in three prisons. East Carroll Parish Prison Farm at Transylvania uh, was a minimum security facility that housed 200 men serving sentences of less than 10 years. 70% of the population was African American. Most of the men had completed less than nine years of formal education. The Louisiana Correctional Institute for Women at St. Gabriel houses minimum, medium, and maximum security inmates. At the time I worked at St. Gabriel, approximately 1,000 women were housed there serving sentences directly or indirectly related to drugs. About 10% were serving life sentences. There are currently two women on death row. One of these women, Antoinette Frank, is a former New Orleans Police Department officer. Approximately 65% of the population is African American. The guards at St. Gabriel, almost exclusively women, are not armed and no gun is kept on, a, on the premises. The Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola is a maximum security prison housing 5,000 inmates on 18,000 acres of Delta farmland. Angola once served as a slave breeding farm and is guarded on three sides only by the Mississippi River. The inmates work the fields that produce food for Angola and other correctional facilities around the state. 1,500 head of cattle and over 200 horses and mules are raised on this working plantation. There are currently 83 men on death row at Angola and 88% of the men incarcerated at Angola will die there. Life means life in Louisiana. This work was first printed on paper, about 13 by 13 inches, then the same size on metal and gridded on the wall. At the same time, I proved some of the images smaller, five by four inches on aluminum and handed stacks of them to friends for comments. It should have been no surprise to me that I loved watching my friends hold the plates in their hands as they viewed the portraits. You can see without being seen, but you can't touch without being touched. There was something about touching the portraits, especially about touching these people that we as a society don't want to admit even exist that I found particularly moving. I decided the portraits needed to be touched. I had a black steel cabinet fabricated to house the plates, a version of sorts of my family's orange wooden box. The cabinet hides as well as holds the plates and requires the viewer to participate by pulling open the heavy steel drawers and removing the images. Information concerning the inmate is etched on the back of each plate. The cabinet also contains two small leather books. One contains all 30,000 plus Department of Corrections numbers for January 1st, 2000. And the second book contains information about each of the prisons, dedications, and a small and a poem by um, C.D. Wright.
To prepare myself to begin this long-term project in the prisons, I chose not to read accounts of prison life or study the numbing statistics, but rather took the advice of Dorothea Lang, who said the best way to go into an unknown territory is to go in ignorant, as ignorant as possible, with your mind wide open as possible, not having to meet anyone else's requirements but your own. I wanted to make a direct as direct a telling as possible to capture, as the poet Jack Gilbert wrote, their hearts in their marvelous cases. But I did need rules. Inmates were not asked to disclose the crime of which they were convicted, nor were they photographed with identifiable prison architecture. <clears throat> Involvement in the project was voluntary, and inmates posed themselves. Each person photographed received between 10 and 15 wallet-sized images of themselves that they could keep or trade with other inmates or send home to family and friends. Approximately 25,000 <clears throat> wallet-sized images were returned to inmates over the course of my time in the prisons. And it's, this print return is, to me, one of the most compelling aspects of the project. Learning and imagining where all these little photos go and the work that they do. This project began as a document comprised of formal portraits of inmates in Louisiana at the turn of the millennium. By the end of the project, I realized it was every bit as much about the power of the personal photograph. Um, when I first started giving these uh, wallet-sized prints back to the inmates, I handed um, a fellow his prints at Angola, and he was walking away, and he was scratching his head, and I heard him say, damn, I done got old. <laughs> and so I turned to the guard and uh, said, so why would he say, damn, I done got old? And he said, well, you know, these guys come in here when they're 18 or younger or 20 or 22, and they stay here until they die a lot of times, until they're 60, 70, 80, and they don't know what they look like because they have these stainless steel security mirrors. So this just completely blew my mind. And uh, then I started looking again at how they were posing themselves. A lot of them were posing themselves very formally, like they were posing in the 19th century. They don't, have, you know, they don't have imagery in front of them. They don't know what they look like, and they don't. I mean, they have a TV on their uh, on their in the dorm, but they don't watch it very much because they're working. Um, so, uh, so that was a real revelation to me. Um, this is a couple at camp at Eagle at Angola. Um, this is a fella at Transylvania, and this was probably the most interesting tattoo. It says, real men eat pussy. And of course, I love saying that in public. So, <laughs> so I always like it. Um, I, I finally figured it out that the best way to get these images back to the men was to have them write their name and a Department of Corrections number on a dry erase board. And this inmate um, has erased that and he's sending a message to someone, apparently. Um, this is how I kept track of uh, information. This is what I asked them. This is all I asked them. Um, if I could use their name in publication, they uh, would put an X next to their name, their DOC number, date of birth, place of birth, length of sentence, uh, if number of children, and their work at the prison. And so on this blue line, you see Ebony Ellis, and she was a tablecloth ironer. And so this was, they had a Halloween haunted house. I don't know that they do that anymore, but uh, I always imagined that she had ironed this and then just made her costume out of it. Another Halloween. And so this is the back of the plate. Um, I just etched each one with the information. Okay. 
This is a fellow, he wanted me to photograph him holding his son's photograph so he could send him the photograph so his son would know that he was uh, thinking about him in prison. Um, this is George Georgetown. Um, the warden of Transylvania Prison sent me to the back to photograph this boat made out of burned matchsticks that one of the inmates had made for a guard. And he said that I could, he told George he could have his photograph made. So it was just George and me in the boat. <clears throat> and when I was photographing, I noticed that something was going on in George's lap. But I didn't look over there. So when I was changing the film, I sort of peeked over there. And I realized that he had a, a big boner. And um, so, you know, I just, you know, carried on. And I gave him his pictures back. And the next time I went to the prison, he came running up to me and said, I need my picture made again. And I said, I said, George, there's a lot of men in line to have their photograph made, and I've already made yours, and you've gotten a lot of uh, pictures back. I said, what'd you do with all those? He said, I sent them to my girlfriends, and they all want some more. <laughs> um, this is the Culinary Institute at the women's prison. Um, I photographed, this one woman came up to me and she said, I really want my photograph taken. And I said, are you on my list? Because I had this list a mile long. And she said, no, I'm not. And I said, well, I don't know if I'm going to get to you. And she said, yes, but, um, uh, you know, I need to, um, send some pictures to my children. Um, I'm down for 99 years and I, um, Armed robbery, nobody got hurt, but my children were angry with me and no, none of them have been in contact with me for the last 15 years that I've been here. I was thinking if I could send them a picture that it would soften their hearts. And of course, I'm turning somersaults to, to take her photograph. And then I saw her about three months later walking down the walk and I said, how are you? And she said, I'm, I'm fine, you're not gonna believe it. Um, my uh, three of my kids came to see me. I said, how many kids do you have? And she said, 19. I sa she said, the, the baby was five when I left, and now he's 18 or 19 years old. So, um, so I love those stories, but I don't know enough of them because you know, the, the photographs were returned a lot of times through the administration. So. This is Children's Visiting Day at the Women's Prison. Artalic D. Wiley. Um, they also have a Mardi Gras, or they used to have a Mardi Gras, I don't know if they do anymore, and so they have a big Mardi Gras parade. And um, this is Zelfia Adams, and she was uh, representing the women in lockdown. Uh, they have a contest to see which group wins the prize, and so some of the women got these jumpers that the women in lockdown wear when they go out to work in the fields, and since they couldn't participate, they represented the women of lockdown. And uh, I was judging the contest, and they won. <laughs> this is Peter Lim, this is, uh, he's a rodeo participant, that's what this striped shirt is. Earl Crumb. This is a, this little box here is actually a bookshelf on wheels. And he said he would wheel it into um, lockdown. And he said at first the men would all scream at him and tell him to get out of here, throw things at him. And he said, I just kept going back and saying, you know, this, I'm on your side. Um, this is going to help the time go faster. And he said, now they're they're all reading, and I said, so what do they like? And he said, they love Danielle Steele. <laughs> I would never have asked this fellow to stand up and lower his head. That's, this is the pose that he 
uh, selected first to, to pose. After finishing uh, One Big Self, I felt like I was walking around in one shoe. Um, so I thought about it for a good long while because I was a little tired after this project, but then I decided to begin a project devoted more directly to the victims of violence. Tooth for an Eye, a choreography of violence in Orleans Parish. The title, Tooth for an Eye, came from C.D. Wright's book-length poem in One Big Self. And it reminds me of writer Julia Reed's line, living in New Orleans is not unlike living in the Old Testament. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So Tooth for an Eye is a combination of the ideas of biblical justice and social realignment spiked with osteo donto kerato prosthesis, a bizarre and gruesome treatment for blindness where the patient's eye tooth is removed, along with adjacent bone and ligaments and fitted with a plastic optical cylinder. This eye tooth and surrounds are then surgically implanted in the patient's cheek for several months to grow a new blood supply, and then removed from the cheek and implanted in the patient's prepared eye, tooth for an eye. Choreography is a specialized form of geography that describes the qualities physical, metaphysical, sociological, conceptual of smaller parts of the world. Ptolemy described choreography as an impression of a part, as when one makes an image of just an eye or just an ear. Choreography is not simply an objective mapping. It is composed of subjective views of place or space. One Big Self consisted of photographing a population invisible to the outside world of free men and women. Tooth for an Eye consists of an attempt to take a very close look at something, someone, that no longer exists in the physical world, a bona fide invisible population existing only as memory and data. Prior to Tooth for an Eye, my photographic work consisted almost exclusively of portraits I had scant interest in landscape photography. In literature, which was my course of study in school, landscape serves as background. It was portraits I wanted to make, but for this project, the physical subjects were gone. A photograph is a kind of memory, a memory trigger, but how does one set out to photograph a memory of persons never known? I needed to conjure the reappearance of those who have gone, and the only way one can approach some such things obliquely and through reference. <clears throat> this attempted conjuring consisted of creating a photographic archive of homicide locations in the American city whose homicide rate is 10 times the national average in my home, New Orleans. Someone told me that Walker Evans had photographed on this corner from the other side of the street, and of course, uh, not in the balcony. Mercedes Place. I thought I would come closer to absorbing the vibration of these locations if I could create a meditative, performative occasion at these sites. So I decided to use the wet plate collodion process, a cumbersome 19th century process where photographer, the photographer, not unlike a tortoise, carries her darkroom with her in order to coat the glass plates and expose and process the, co the toxic concoction before the plate dries. I constructed a darkroom in my car, gathered my camera and chemicals, polished my glass plates, grabbed my map, and set out. I was working alone, camera left unattended while standing under a dark cloth at the back of my pilot. It was June in New Orleans, about 120 degrees inside my traveling darkroom, where I was breathing ether along with other chemicals and wondering when I might find myself in a difficult social situation. 
Finally, wet plate just wasn't working for me there in the hood, under the hood. I retreated and regrouped, dragged out my 8x10 camera and began throwing eBay lenses on it. And there, right before my eyes, a lens that did not cover the film plane of my camera but rather formed a perfect circle. My God, I thought, it was the wheel of fortune. <laughs> the luck of the draw equivalent Warden Kane emphasized with his biscuits so many years earlier at Angola. Using the 8x10 and Wheel of Fortune lens, I still had the cumbersome, slow process I imagined might allow time required to access my subject. I used a very slow film, ASA 6, um, to disappear much of the mechanical, botanical, and human movement to spectral blur. I wanted to depopulate the sites and allow the disappeared to haunt the images. I spent a lot of time photographing sites for this project, but the time it took to research the homicides and plot them on Google Maps certainly eclipsed my time in the field. The New Orleans Police Department was unresponsive to my request for information, so I researched the Times-Picayune archives for many months in the paper on a daily basis. In the afterword to Tooth for an Eye, I described my general working style for this project as spontaneous, happenstantial, and voluntary, inverted, intuitive, unbidden, subjective, systematic, and unsystematic obsessiveness. <laughs> we don't choose our obsession, writes novelist Zachary Lazar. Our obsessions, invariably against our deepest wishes, choose us. That was certainly the case here. The research phase of Tooth for an Eye was nothing if not obsessive, and nothing I would have ever chosen. It was like crack, and I was consumed by it. I felt awful. I was convinced I was serious, seriously ill, perhaps dying. Months later, when I hadn't been researching homicides, I woke up one morning and realized I was fine. So uh, this is how I did it. I would take sections of the city, and I would um, print out um, the information and staple it, all those staples down the side. Um, and then I would do a little uh, kind of uh, fingernail, a little um, of the important information. Then I would go out uh, in my car and circle the blocks and make sure. I, I ended up hiring somebody to assist me because um, for almost all of the work because I mostly I just didn't want to die alone. But um, uh, it gave, but it gave me, <laughs> it gave me a, a, a little uh, more courage. But I, you know, I would circle the block, and if it looked uh, really sketchy, I wouldn't get out. Uh, sometimes I'd go back later. But, um, and I didn't photograph every spot, but um, a, a good many of them. Um, <clears throat> sometimes it's difficult to know when a project is finished. Sometimes I don't want a project to end. I remember agonizing over my expulsion from Angola prison. I got kicked out the first time I went there. Uh, and wondering if I might possibly find happiness living in a cottage just outside the main gate. <laughs> but I haven't experienced a, a single sec se second of separation anxiety from uh, Tooth for an Eye. It was a pretty difficult uh, project. Although this work is uh, printed quite large for the gallery walls, um, it is also like one big self made to be touched. Uh, I gathered the archive into six large bound ledgers and commissioned the building of a long sweet gum, hickory, and sheet metal viewing table for the work. In the ledgers, the information concerning the homicides here, uh, uh, appears on the, face, on the page facing it, not like this. I just scrunched that up for the slide. But for instance, um, this is, uh, I think his name is Brandon Agason. It's at the Olive uh, Street Meat Market. I think that's what it's called. I can't read it from here. But um, he, you know, went down for a quart of milk. And when he was leaving, somebody grabbed him and used him as a human shield uh, in a drive-by shooting. So. Um, one of the, so I guess, something I didn't really think through when I started this project 
I didn't realize that uh, it's also because it's a document of things that have uh, disappeared following the storm, the federal flood, AKA Katrina. Uh, this is the way, this was a double um, shotgun, of course that's what we call them down there, shotgun houses. Um, uh, so some of them are already gone and then a, a number of them after I photographed them are, are gone now. So I had a rubber stamp made and uh, I would rubber stamp in the middle of a page uh, of, the, of the ledger and so the image would be on the right and the rubber stamp is in the middle of the page on the left and the National Gallery asked if I could reproduce that uh, on the wall. So I think it worked very well. I was very happy with it. Oops, can't miss this one. This is where uh, my husband and I got married <laughs> up on the porch. Roosevelt's Black Pearl, someone went in to rob uh, the place and there was only $200 in the till so they killed everyone that was there. Um, Adolf Grimes III was sitting in front of his grandmother's house. Uh, he had a job in Houston, he was in town for New Year's Eve. About uh, two dozen plainclothes policemen came running out and uh, shot him, I don't know, 14 or 18 times as he tried to leap, run to his grandmother's house. So this is one of many federal investigations into police misconduct or whatever you want to call it. Um, this is no longer there. This is down uh, in Holy Cross and Interestingly, this is where Cain killed Abel on the side of the building there, and um, I think his son killed his mother at this site. There was a big shootout in the street. I think several people were um, injured, but there was one guy who came in after work for a drink and inside the bar, and he's the one that got killed. This is Big Time Tips Bar and Lounge. I believe there's so many homicides at this place that they finally shut it down um, a couple of years ago. And I kept reading uh, in the paper, um, died face down in the ditch, died face up in the street. So this was my imagining of um, maybe the last sight. Um, this fellow saw. Um, this is um, another installation shot from the show at Jack Shaman Gallery. And these are cast aluminum frames, and they're after those little um, picture frames that you find on graves, a lot of them in New Orleans, where you lift the lid and there's an enameled portrait of the deceased there. So these are friends and family of homicide victims in New Orleans. Uh, and my thinking behind this, it, it's just like eight seconds and it dissolves in and out, there's no sound. Um, but after eight years, someone was finally um, arrested in my mother's murder. Two years later, uh, a long trial, I had to testify. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing how the, the uh, justice system, if you are a victim, how you are sort of abandoned. So at the end of this trial, um, I was uh, able to stand up and um, make a, um, what do you call those? Uh, statements of, um, impact. impact statement, thank you. And, and it was one of the most cathartic things I've ever done in my life. Um, so this was just a way for people that had lost friends and family, sort of that gesture to bear witness to their loss. So that's what that is. And then people started bringing me photographs of um, their family who had been 
m murdered. And um, I don't show them like this. In fact, I don't show them. They used it in the book, uh, the publisher did, but um, I just wanted to show, give you an example. There's a lot of photographs of very young men in uh, coffins. Um, yep. So, um, is everybody happy? <laughs> <laughs> At the end of this project, I was so depressed, and I, I, and I just kept thinking, <laughs> I've got to do something a little lighter. And so I was trying to come up with something, and and I thought maybe, <laughs> I would thought maybe kittens of Ireland was, might be a, a remedy, um, but um, lo and behold, uh, I got a call from the prison. And uh, Angola, the, that had kicked me out, and um, so they were uh, producing the Passion Play, or as they call it, the Life of Jesus Christ. And so I went back over and was photographing, um, doing some stills of the participants. And uh, what I really loved about love about this project is that the way their lives intersect with the characters that they're playing. So uh, Layla is, uh, he's, one of the, he's getting ready to um, bribe Judas to turn on Jesus uh, for, and here he's got these coins, they even minted these coins at the prison. Uh, and Layla was involved when he was very young with a friend, they abducted a woman, um, took her to an ATM, got like, $153 each, let her out, and told her that they would leave her car where they picked her up. And of course she got to a phone and they were immediately arrested. So, but because there was a gun used in the commission of the crime, um, they're both doing time, a life without possibility of parole for like $153.23 or something. Uh, they were obviously not hardcore criminals uh, because they didn't do a very good job. But um, he's, he's a lovely guy, actually. And, um, but I just thought it was so ironic that here he is holding these, these minted coins. So they're making their costumes like uh, this guy's breastplate is the seat of a chair. And they're making their swords out of cardboard and duct tape. Uh, you know, uh, football helmets. Um, this guy, Terry Williams, uh, was a hitman for the uh, drug gangs in New Orleans. And he, he told um, uh, my friend Zach Lazar that went with me when I was doing this, a writer, uh, that he had killed nine men by himself and probably 30 with uh, other people. And Zach asked him how he could go on. Um, and he said he gets up every day hoping that he can do something to keep at just one kid in New Orleans from uh, ending up in Angola. Uh, Lavelle Tolliver as Judas. And um, so this is kind of the end of it, but I just want to wonder if you would indulge me because um, I went over after I shot these stills and I took a 35 millimeter uh, film crew and we did these um, screen tests of some of these guys. And I've just got like, it's like a minute and a half. Uh, but I just wanted to see them large because I haven't done anything with them yet. So they're, they're just raw. Uh, so I'm going to do that now.
This is Wilbert Marcel, and, and he was a busker in New Orleans, and I told him to stay out of trouble. I was coming over, and he, got, he was put in lockdown. And somehow I got to, to film him um, tapping on lockdown. And I said, so why was he in lockdown? And they said, it's aggravated masturbation. Now, I don't know what that is, and I don't want to know what that is. But uh, uh, as it turned out, I was so disappointed, but it was um, kind of special. So, well, thank you very, very much. <laughs>